it's going. My name is Edward Hezier. I have the pleasure to be uh, your chair for the next session. Um, I'm head of the Centre for Aid and Public Expenditure at the Overseas Development Institute in London. This session um, follows quite naturally from the ones that have gone before, looking at some of the tax and revenue side. We're now going to turn our attention more exclusively to government expenditures, uh, particularly focus on improving um, the public expenditure management and the quality and effectiveness of public expenditure. As you'll see from the issues note, we have three broad questions uh, to hand today. First of all, where do we stand on current practices um, in developing countries on efforts to improve public expenditure? Second, what are the lessons that we're taking so far from um, decades of experience in attempting to reform and strengthen public expenditure management and the concerted international effort and investment in that process? And thirdly, um, given the, the venue and given the OECD um, draft strategy on development, how could international processes and international actors help? Just to, to recap, why is, um, you know, what do we know? Well, there's a good degree of apparent consensus here. We all agree this is important. Busan had an effective institutions building block, which we're looking to, to move forward on. The links to service delivery and the role of budgets and fiscal policy in contributing to that are um, much more clearly understood now. And there's a very strong emphasis on accountability. So we're going to try and pull some of those uh, issues out during the session. There's also quite a lot of an apparent consensus on the challenges associated with getting better budgets and strengthening public expenditure management. Uh, <coughs> Do best practices automatically translate into developing countries? Where are we on more contingent approaches? Uh, why aren't um, budget practices implemented? The implementation deficit, for example. Fragmentation of effort across donor, across um, international organizations, across organizations, across elements of the budget cycle. These are all the sorts of challenges that are well known and well rehearsed. Equally, the responses. The issues note talks about the Cadbury principles on good financial governments. I think we'll hear some more about that. Equally, the Manila consensus on strengthening public financial management. A lot of the phrases that we heard this morning around transparency, ownership, capacity, political leadership, accountability, they resonate strongly in this arena, in this agenda as well. So today I'm delighted to introduce um, a distinguished panel um, who will give four different perspectives on this issue, four different but, but complementary perspectives. Um, at my far left, um, Florencio Abad, who is Secretary of Budget and Management in the Philippines, and therefore has a first-hand role in leading some of the reform efforts in the, in the Philippines, which has made some, some, some quite impressive progress, but equally, as he would admit, is still grappling with some particular challenges around this. He has also um, been a congressional representative as well, and has served as Secretary of the Department of Education. So he brings perspectives from the demand side, but also from a sector. That will be very interesting. We'll then, um, immediately to uh, Mr. Abad's right, Linda van Gelder, who is Director of Governance and Public Sector at the World Bank, and therefore leads the efforts on the renewed strategy on the bank's engagement on public sector governance issues. But also in her previous, uh, many of her previous roles at the, um, the bank has had more operational responsibility for engaging in country program levels, bank efforts to support um, public financial management, public getting better public expenditures across Asia, the, the Pacific, Yemen, Afghanistan, and elsewhere. Immediately to my left is uh, Jorgen Cosmo, who is the Auditor General of Norway and also Chair of the InterSci Development Initiative. And he, as well as having been the Auditor General for several years now and leading the um, professional role of, of InterSci across countries, has also been formerly a parliamentarian, um, a minister, speaker in parliament, um, and uh, was also involved in municipal issues as well. So very able to, to comment on the, the accountability domain. Finally, to my right, Neil Cole, who is currently both the Executive Secretary of CABRI, the Collaborative African Budget Reform Initiative, um, a group and a network of African senior budget officials, um, proximate to the senior budget officials network at the OECD, um, also Director of Regional Integration, and formerly within South Africa, the, uh, a Director in Budget Planning and Expenditure Management, so therefore closely involved in some of the reforms of public expenditure. The way we're going to run the session is to try and make this a little more um, interactive. Um, we'll ask, I'm going to ask each of the speakers to offer an initial five to seven minute, minute inter, um, intervention, which just sets out 
that sets the, the framing for the session. What do we know about what's working, where it's working, why it's working, what some of the caveats are, and to start to help us trace a little bit the story about how much of this is an issue of country-level challenges and responses, and how much of this is to do with the international domain and the role for concerted international action. And then we will have a bit of a discussion among the panelists at the front and throw it open to you for comments and questions. So I'm going to ask speakers to try and keep to time and to take not more than seven minutes for some initial provocative, stimulating questions to get us going after lunch. Uh, Mr. Abad, please. Thank you, uh, Edward. First of all, uh, let's, let me just thank the OECD for uh, giving me the opportunity to make uh, this presentation to you this afternoon. The Aquino administration is a 20-month-old uh, government, so I'm not very sure if the uh, initiatives, the reforms that we have instituted have, uh, you know, already taken root to give me the confidence to share with you the lessons learned uh, from the uh, 20 months uh, of being in government. Uh, I guess you must ha just have to take uh, this presentation uh, in that uh, limited light. This, this administration, the way it got to power, uh, for the most part has defined the way uh, it has uh, uh, defined its uh, public expenditure policy, as well as the, the way it, 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 uh, it, the way it implements or executes its uh, uh, public expenditure uh, management. This is a, a special administration or unique administration in the sense that uh, for the second time in the history of Philippine politics, uh, President Benigno Aquino came to power on the back of a, a popular uh, presidential draft. And the very first time that this happened to us was in 1986 when, uh, her, when his mother uh, was asked by the people to run for president and became uh, the first president after martial law was uh, dismantled via what, what is now globally famous uh, people power uh, operating outside of the realm of the uh, Constitution. In a way, uh, President Aquino was also catapulted to power via people power, but I guess the difference is in this instance, he did not have to operate uh, outside of the Constitution, but uh, he went on to challenge uh, traditional power brokers in the uh, you know, the difficult, unpredictable electoral political arena. But because uh, he owes his presidency to the people, the president has been very keen on making sure uh, that his government is able to restore uh, people's faith in a new administration. Uh, for, for, for the longest time, despite the fact that uh, we have, we've had two people power uprisings that uh, replaced sitting presidents uh, over the last uh, 26 years. Uh, many, th these two dramatic uh, exemplar of popular uprising did not really bring about uh, the profound changes that uh, people expected. But this time around when the president asked our people, what do you want me to do? There were just three things that they reminded him that he should always remember, deal with corruption, reduce poverty, and give us jobs. That's why uh, he set forth on a vigorous anti-corruption uh, campaign, which over the past 18 months led to the charges being filed and the arrest of the former president, uh, the impeachment of the national ombudsman, and the ongoing impeachment of uh, the chief justice of the Supreme Court and many generals and cabinet secretaries of the past being, being charged and thrown into jail. But at the same time, he also had to contend with uh, you know, almost unreasonable uh, uh, expectations that change can come about uh, fast, uh, knowing fully well uh, the many difficulties that stand in the way. Another difficulty that the president you know, had to contend with as how do you mitigate or, if that is possible, eliminate the distorting influence of uh, political patronage uh, 
uh, in the economy, in, in the political uh, life. Uh, and you know, one of the things that we observe in these recent uh, uh, efforts to hold former officials accountable is that we're not just creating apprehensions among the immediate officials of the past, but even those who for some time have benefited from the status quo have begun to feel a little bit nervous about the efforts, the, the unrelenting efforts of President uh, Aquino. Uh, and, and in some ways, we have seen how they have thrown monkey wrenches along uh, the reform initiatives being, being started by the president. Of course, uh, for him, the most pressing challenge is uh, how to, deliver, how to deliver results very fast, uh, good governance, social services, jobs, economic services, through a bureaucracy that uh, for years has been uh, uh, traumatized by you know, one government after another being involved in various degrees of uh, corruption, to a point that uh, in many instances, uh, the tendency of the bureaucracy has been to stand on the fence and watch uh, what the government is doing and hoping that Perhaps uh, this uh, passing administration will soon be over. In this context, uh, we have to pursue certain uh, public expenditure management uh, imper imperatives. Uh, for example, uh, the need to spend according to uh, priorities. Uh, one of the things that the president did at the, at the start of his administration is to define areas of priorities that uh, will be the focus of all uh, development programs for the next five years. And these are in the area of good governance, poverty reduction, uh, expanding the economy, peace, and uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation. Uh, one of the things that we adopted, which uh, did not make me uh, popular among many of uh, government agencies, was the use of a zero-based uh, budgeting approach in our budget process, which led to the elimination of uh, quite a number of uh, programs and projects, especially those uh, with the military and the uh, police. But, uh, but at the same time, we had to make sure that uh, uh, we did spend uh, for the critical services that the country needed. And you know, checking on leakages and going over cost assumptions and cost structures uh, slowed down the process to a point that uh, you know, we significantly affected uh, the underspending the uh, GDP growth. Uh, through all that, one thing we learn is uh, public expenditure management at its core is really a political process. We need to deal with uh, uh, par parallel informal structures in every agency and level of uh, government uh, who have varying degrees of influence in the way public resources are allocated. And because of that, it was important, it's important for us uh, outside of the agencies of government through linkages with civil society organizations, business associations, and even multilateral agencies to build uh, countervailing influences uh, to minimize uh, the distorting influences of uh, informal parallel structures uh, in government, particularly resource-rich departments and revenue generation agencies. And at the same time, make sure that uh, we deliver, as the president said, uh, as, a, as he promised, good governance can, in fact, uh, lead to immediate, direct, and substantial benefit to, to, the, to the poor. Sorry, sorry to cut in, just to say we're just running quite close to time. Okay. What, what all this has done is uh, you know, brought forth uh, renewed uh, optimism in, in government and uh, led to uh, unprecedented investments in social services, economic services, and, uh, and the expansion of the uh, economy. It has also uh, allowed the country to gain uh, recognition as an attractive investments, uh, investment destination, helped by uh, four ratings upgrades the past 18 months. And of course, uh, uh, as a result of all that, the president continues to enjoy unprecedented uh, approval ratings, uh, which has allowed him to invest uh, political capital in these difficult uh, reform uh, initiatives. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I, I think that starts to put on the, the table a very rich menu of some of the, the explicit political economy challenges and some of the wider context in which PFM reform um, takes place. And I think we'll come back in a minute to, um, uh, to some specific questions and ask a little more detail. Um, before we do that, maybe I could turn to Linda and invite you to sort of give a perspective from, in a way, the other end of the, of the lens, the, the World Bank and, and how you're viewing and approaching this. Yes, I believe the mic will work up there. Great. Thanks very much. Um, I very much appreciate the organizers inviting me, and I, I'm, I'm pleased to be participating on this panel. Um, what I'd like to do in these very brief remarks is actually touch on three areas. Once, although Ed has already said that we all know public expenditure management is important, I'd like to just sketch out a little bit about why it's important and why it's important that as development partners, we do better in terms of the assistance that we provide. Second, I want to sketch out a little bit what the current thinking is in the World Bank in terms of how we're adjusting our support to public sector management, including issues of public expenditure management. And third, very finally, I want to leave a few final pitches uh, of, of issues that I think are critically important. So if we turn to the question of why is public expenditure management so important for development, then I think we all know that public expenditures represent trillions of dollars a year. And we all know that not all of this money is used to good effect. And so the amount of resources that are available if public expenditures are used well can have a tremendous development impact. If we look at public investments, for example, there's been some recent research by, M by IMF colleagues that actually have looked at that that if you actually took into account inefficiencies in public investment management, that in fact you may actually have an increase in capital stock of maybe only about 50% of what you would expect. So there's huge potential to have improved outcomes. That said, there's been substantial assistance by development partners working to help support countries to strengthen their public investment management systems. But the record has really been quite mixed. The World Bank has an internal evaluations group, and in 2008, they did an evaluation of all the World Bank's support to public sector management approach. And they found that of all the areas, we did a bit better on supporting public financial management than some of the other areas. But more recently, we've actually dug into that data, and we found that when you hold certain other factors to account, we haven't really even done better in public financial management than in other areas. So I think we need to be very careful about having any kind of false sense that we're actually being as effective as we could be in this area. I was also quite surprised by some recent work that we did looking at post-conflict countries, the most fragile of states where donor collaboration is incredibly important. And one of the findings that came out of these case studies was that, in fact, donor collaboration, donor coordination actually emerged fairly late in the game and wasn't really in place in a sound and solid way from, from the early days. So another area where we, can, where we can improve. If you look at issues of fiscal transparency, a topic of discussion this morning, there's 40 or so sets of uh, standards on fiscal transparency. There's national laws like the Dodd-Frank law. There's norms by international organizations like the excellent IMF's Code of Good Practices on fiscal transparency. There are multi-donor multi -donor initiatives like PIFA. There are civil society initiatives like open budget surveys. Yet in practice, improvements in this area across countries, developed and developing alike, are slow. There are overlaps, there's gaps, um, and there are few mechanisms for monitoring and for enforcement. So another area for much progress. In the World Bank, over the past year, we've been looking at how can we adjust our approach to how we support countries to strengthen their public sector management systems, including public financial management. And there are a few things that we've identified in terms of how we think we can do better. One is we believe that there is a need for continuous engagement rather than episodic engagement in terms of supporting countries. And this really requires that we're serious about working collaboratively with development partners. Second, we're emphasizing the need for a diagnostic approach to how we design projects. We need to focus on what the functional problem is rather than coming in with a pre-cooked solution or a particular form that we're advising countries to implement. 
And we need to do better about engaging stakeholders in identifying what those functional problems are and, and being involved in implementation and monitoring of, of reform programs. And we also need to use political economy analysis prospectively. We need to understand why are current dysfunctions in equilibrium? And what does this actually imply for the feasibility of a reform program? A third area that we're highlighting is the need to actually know better. In fact, we have very few metrics that look at the strength of country systems. PIFA is one exception, but even there, there's very little granular detail on strength of country institutions. In all of our projects, we don't have a very good learning that's actually coming out of the projects. Uh, we have idiosyncratic project measurements, uh, and research is rarely built into our project designs. So this is another area that going forward in the World Bank, we'll really be focusing on. So that brings me to my final pitch of a few things that I hope will really be part of the agenda that we discuss in terms of how we can work collaboratively to help support countries as they develop their public expenditure systems. One is really, as I said, taking a problem-driven approach uh, rather than specifying particular functional forms. Second, a need to be realistic and very attuned to the political economy realities in which we operate. Third, we really need to move beyond the tacit knowledge that we have and make a real push on measures of strength of institutions so that we can stimulate research and learning about what works and what doesn't. And finally, we need to press forward on making data available in open and transparent ways that are accessible, both to promote accountability and, as I just said also, to promote and stimulate research and learning about how we can better support countries. Thank you. Linda, I think that really helpfully sets out an agenda of, of issues that we can we can pick up in, in discussion. And particularly the, the phrases political economy resonate, the issues around uh, public investments and the inefficiencies, which I'd speak, speak to that, um, metrics and diagnostics. And also introducing this issue of differentiation almost. So there's certain categories, different types of countries within uh, fragile states in particular, where different things are possible. Um, you're going to might invite you to... Uh, um, offer a few part sort of starting words to kick us off, particularly on the accountability domain. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear audience. I'm representing the INTUSOI, the International Organization for Supreme Audit Institutions. It's a huge organization. 190 countries are members of the INTUSOI. That should mean that we have 190 supreme audit institutions in the world, and we have. But I don't, I don't tell a secret if I say that uh, far too many of those sites don't have the possibility to work, don't have the possibility to deliver, don't have the possibility to produce report, both neither public or to the parliaments, due to the political conditions in the countries, due to the lack of skills in such a way that they don't have the capacity to work within this. That's re the reality. Uh, some uh, science in the developed countries has uh, decided to start program and activities to try to build capacity within these uh, sites. <coughs> and what we have seen is that where this is happening, together with the donors, where you can, besides building capacity within the Supreme Audit Institution, also work with the government to accept the Supreme Audit Institution as an independent body who can deliver and building a political and administrative infrastructure in the country, we see that this has a great success. Rwanda has been mentioned earlier today. I can say Tanzania. I can say Zambia, where we have seen that developed science has gone together with the donor society, make a real effort to build the institutions that necessary to develop good policy. You say, better policies for better lives. 
It's not a question about what we decide here in the OECD. It's not a question of we decide in the developed countries. It's a question about what kind of politics are we able to give these countries a possibility to develop in such a way that they can create better lives. And for that, you have to have uh, institutions that can produce good governance. You have to have parliaments, but you also have to have independent institutions who can see to audit, scrutiny, and build the, the necessary independent security around uh, their politics. But I don't, there is no secret that uh, there is a far way to go. Um, we have started a cooperation between Intosai and the donor community, and there are 16 donor institutions who participate in this cooperation to try to develop a global initiatives for, uh, for this issue. We made a stock-taking report all over the world, looking into size and looking into regions where there is a real need for support, and came to uh, approximately $250 million are needed, in fact, to bring some of these highs up to a level which is more or less acceptable. And as I say, it's not enough to develop the SAI, you has also to develop the government and the parliament and the different institutions which is necessary in such a way that the SAI can exist. You have to build an accounting system because it's difficult to audit without an accounting system. All these countries which are in really need to support, they need all of this. Therefore, it has to be a broad cooperation between the Supreme Audit Institution and the Donor Society. After this stock-taking report, we asked for a global response on projects, projects who should be ready to put to, uh, into work, and we got a result approximately allow, um, around $90 million, which is, in fact, ready to be implemented. But we lack the money. This has not, it's not donors enough to provide for these $90 million that can give uh, the size in the developing countries the possibility to, in fact, invest in uh, that kind of, uh, of development. It is a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of what's needed, of what's given in developing countries, approximately 0.2%. We need that, in fact, to go further on with the development. So I hope that some other donors can come to the, uh, to the floor and be able to produce that kind of money that's necessary for science to take a responsibility for the human training. The existing uh, size in the developing countries are ready to take a responsibility for the developing of the human cap capacity. But to get a site to function, you need premises. You need IT equipment. You need cars. You need possibilities to go around. And you need an infrastructure to work within. And this must be a possibility for the International Donor Society to participate within. What we see is where we succeed, the SAI can, in fact, really improve good governance in the different countries. We see that a developed SAI can play a role in making better policies for better lives. On the other side, it's also a guarantee for the donors that the money they invest in developing also are scrutinized and audited in the right way. For example, for Norway, giving a lot of money for protecting rainforests, also in Indonesia. I, as an Auditor General of Norway, has to rely upon the, the Indonesian side to take care of the audit of the, those money. 
and report in such a way that I can get an overview. When I am going to report to the Norwegian Parliament about how this money are used. So this is also a possibility for the international society to have control of the money which is invested in developing. So I really hope that OECD, when making the program for the future, can put the development of the Supreme Audit Institution to the agenda and try to give that a priority in uh, the future. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much. I think there's a, a strong pitch for stronger support to SAIs, but a few questions for us to explore about how they link to other areas of the public expenditure chain. Perhaps I could turn to um, Neil, who can give us a sort of perspective from um, African country members through Cadbury. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ed, and um, my visits to, to Paris and to, to the OECD um, are getting better. Uh, my, my very first visit to Paris, I got um, ripped off by the taxi driver, and, um, and the hotel that I was booked into was undergoing renovations. Um, it, it certainly taught me some important lessons, um, lessons about planning, lessons about budgeting, um, lessons about decision making and also um, lessons about how evaluation um, needs to feed into, 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 into um, what it is that you do um, the next time. And I think the point was made earlier about us constantly repeating, um, repeating our, our mistakes. Um, let me, let me um, take a, a few seconds to speak about to speak about CABRI, um, the Collaborative Africa Budget Reform Initiative, um, and that's for the purpose of, I think, the 2% um, of the audience that I um, believe still do not know about, about CABRI. Um, start by saying that CABRI is a very small um, network at the moment um, of senior budget officials, um, and its membership is drawn from um, senior budget officials um, in Africa from ministries of finance and, and planning um, and, and as a very similar basis to the senior budget officials um, network that exists here in the OECD. And in fact, um, the, the senior budget officials um, of the OECD played an important um, part of getting, getting the, the, the network of senior budget officials in Africa going. Um, CABRI is essentially a, a peer sharing and, and peer learning network um, that has also now developed a capacity to, to, um, to examine what works when and, and, and how. Um, some of the work that we've been involved in is um, medium term expenditure framework reforms, um, helping countries to improve um, expenditure management, helping countries to improve the information that they, that they put out on the decisions that they take and also the, 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 the allocation of, of resources. Um, we do, we're doing some work on program budgeting and also on fiscal and aid transparency. Um, I think it's our, our sector dialogues that we're involved in that um, points to several lessons that I think are important for the dis dis this discussion that we, that we are having here today. Um, and let me turn to a health policy dialogue that CABRI initiated. And the intention was to bring finance officials into the same room with health officials. Because typically, um, in the engagement in the budget officials, health officials believe that if you give us more funding, we are able to solve the problems or the challenges that we have faced, and we are in a position to improve, to improve the outcomes. Finance officials think quite differently. Finance officials think that it is about um, capacity, um, and finance officials think that it's about improving efficiencies. And if you improve efficiency with better capacity, you are going to, you are going to be able to possibly use less resources and you're possibly going to have better, better, better outcomes. And that points to an important, I think, precondition and something that we have learnt um, um, 
in ways to improve, to improve um, public expenditure. And that is that um, there has to be, within the budget process and within the planning process, there has to be a greater focus on what achieves value for money or better value for money. That throwing money at a problem and wishing that it's going to go away seldom works. And I think there are two examples that we can think of. And the one is within the EU context, and the other one is, is within, within the AU context. Um, we know that ba the bailout is not going to work if the bailout is not accompanied with capaci necessary capacity building and also some very critical reforms to the public financial management system, systems of the countries that are going to be receiving those, receiving those, those bailouts. Um, and that's my one controversial point that, I, that I'm allowed to make. Um, within the AU context, there's a continental um, shift towards adopting um, budget targets. Um, so countries um, that, are, that are members of the AU have to allocate 10% of the budget um, to health, they have to allocate 5% of the budget to agriculture, and they are asked to allocate about 15% of the budget to, to, um, to education. Um, so that gives us 30% of the budget that has been allocated. And there is a, 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 a push, especially by, by the sector ministries, that, these, that the AU at a continental level adopts these spending targets. And, and it is hoped that, that by moving up um, your budget allocations to these spending targets that you are going to achieve greater, great, greater, greater outcomes. Um, when, when finance ministries um, stepped into this discussion, they said, hold on. Um, well, firstly, if you do the simple arithmetic, then it's not going to work out because that takes you to about, I think, about 30% of your budget allocated on three programs. Um, and if you're spending about 40%, 47% of your budget on, on, on public sector wage, it takes you to about 70%, and you know, just under 30% is not enough to do the other things. Um, you're going to have quite a few very angry ministers. Um, so budgeting cannot be about, cannot be about, uh, about the setting of targets, and it cannot also be about you know, just throwing, throwing money at, at a problem and thinking that it is, it is, going, to, it is going to go away. Um, I think it is, it is about constantly examining that link between the inputs, the outputs, and the outcomes. Um, and the budget process is an important tool that we have, not only in the Ministry of Finance, but in all of government, to, to examine issues of, of value for money. Um, let me make a, a quick point on um, what I think is also important in terms of what, we, what we've learned, and that is that politics do matter. And politics matter because it can have a good influence on the budget process um, and improve um, the spending decisions that are taken. But politics can also be a very bad influence on, on the process. I think politics is good when it contributes towards political buy-in, when you have a, a, a collective that is ensuring that, um, that policies inform the budget um, decisions that are taken. Um, and, 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 and are involved in the entire process um, and where, where you do have um, your, your cabinet or uh, colleagues of a minister of finance that are able to support the decisions that, that are taken and also understand why those decisions are, are being taken. But we also know that politics can be bad. Um, powerful ministers sometimes walk into the office of finance ministers and say, you know, you need to increase the allocation to my ministry. And we know that powerful ministers are usually ministers that come from the security sector, um, the kind of things that we maybe should not be spending um, as much money as we currently are spending. Um, a, a, a very important initiative that has, that has um, taken root in many, in many African countries, in ministries of finance, in, in the budget process, has been the establishment of ministerial committees on the budget. And these ministerial committees on the budget are um, a, a, a grouping of senior ministers. They come into a committee with the Minister of Finance. They remove their sector hats, so they're no longer the Minister of Education. They're no longer the Minister of Health. Um, 
but they, they, they discuss the budget as a whole. Um, so they will look at the fiscal framework, they will look at the spending priorities, they will look at plans of departments, and they'll match. They'll match the top with the bottom. Um, and what that does is that when the Minister of Finance then goes into, into Cabinet to present um, uh, proposed spending plans, um, there is buy-in at, at that point. Um, so let me, let, let, me, let me conclude at this point, um, and I hope that I can, I can come back um, a bit later to speak about what I think some of the um, reform priorities are um, that will contribute towards better um, um, budget decisions and also um, improve spending. Thank you very much. What I propose to do briefly now is to sort of abuse my position as chair and, and see if I can ask a few follow-up questions to draw out a couple of themes and then we'll put that back um, to you and ask for some comments um, and reflections and perhaps any specific questions to the, um, to the panel. We have about, um, about 40, 45 minutes. And maybe if I could just start almost with where um, Neil left off, this question of powerful ministers and the issue of interference. I think you mentioned sort of military and security sector. And I was quite struck, uh, Mr. Abad, by saying that in terms of some of the initial reforms you started were zero-based budgeting, reducing expenditure programs. I think you mentioned police and military. So a lot of the experience analysis would tell us that you've started tackling precisely the most difficult thing. Maybe it would be useful to sort of tell us a little bit more about how did that happen in practice? What were the ingredients of that particular reform, and where do you see the dangers to its, uh, to its sort of subsequent progress and sustainability? Yeah, well, fortunately for the Aquino administration, when we took over, one of those departments or agencies identified uh, in the media and generally in society as most corrupt were the uh, military and the uh, police. In fact, uh, there were exposés made on uh, ghost uh, soldiers and ghost police. And uh, when I went over to uh, investigate, I was shocked to discover that uh, these unfilled uh, items uh, in the police and the military uh, was in the magnitude of about 15 to 20% of total uh, salary. So one of the first things that I did with the president's permission is to withhold about 20% of the budget of the military and said, unless you submit a roster of uh, soldiers and non-uniform personnel, you're not going to get this, uh, this money. And, uh, and they complied because the, the other thing that we withheld were pensions, which we also discovered were fraught with uh, irregularity. So for the first time in the history of our country, we now have a complete government manpower invent inventory system, which is held back by the refusal of the military and the police to submit their roster, always using the excuse of national security as a reason why they cannot uh, disclose uh, uh, the roster. possible at that particular time to start taking on those interests, um, which was perhaps different and suggest ways in which others could look for opportunities to grapple with this? It, had, it has a lot to do with the leadership of uh, the president. He's really put himself up there saying, there is no way that we can compromise with corruption in my administration. And I think that message reverberated through the whole of the uh, uh, bureaucracy and uh, uh, and the military was not uh, an exception. So that, that helps a lot. You know, the Philippine president on paper is, is a very powerful office. And it can be an instrument for bad, or, and it can be an instrument for good. And you see that powerful office, especially in the manner that he was elected into office. He was, we can say, relatively autonomous from uh, um, you know, vested interests that have dominated or distorted uh, resource allocation in the Philippines. So that, I guess, that, that also uh, influenced a lot, uh, you know, the, our, our ability to stand our ground and insist that, uh, uh, that no agency should be exempt from uh, the uh, call of the president for transparency and accountability. 
if I may, I'll just sort of move just quickly, just to pick up the point, Neil, reflecting across sort of cabaret members, and firstly, whether this same point resonates, almost the phrase I took a little bit was, with the permission of the president, which struck me as quite significant. But building on what you were mentioning, Neil, this idea of also building institutions around this as well, ministerial committees, which struck me as, as an interesting, slightly different mechanism to try and lock in those sorts of mechanisms. I mean, a little bit of reflection would be interesting. Thank you very much, and I mean, this points to to a piece of work that, that Cabri undertook um, together with um, the, the Tax Administrators Forum and also with AFRISAE, and that is um, a, a study on the status of financial management um, governance in Africa, um, what reforms have been, have been undertaken, um, and, and one of the major findings um, was that we needed to institutionalize um, many of the, the changes um, that have been brought about, um, both in tax administration, um, in budget planning and, 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 and execution, um, and also at, at, the level of, at the level of audit. Um, we, we're hoping that, um, that the declaration that, we've, that we, we, we have drawn out of the study, um, a declaration that sets out six principles, um, principles of accountability um, and building of accountability institutions, principles on fiscal um, transparency, um, et cetera, that, that these principles in a declaration will be presented to ministers of finance at an appropriate um, opportunity. Um, and, that, and that ministers of finance um, and maybe ministers of, of planning as well um, will adopt these, these principles as, as, as African principles for good public financial governance and, and hopefully to escalate that to, to, to a summit. Um, but yes, um, I mean, what, what, we've, what, we've, is what we've realized in, in both the, the good financial governance study and our aid and fiscal transparency study is, is, is that there is a need to, to build on lots, many of the reforms that we've undertaken and one way of doing that is to now institutionalize them um, and to, to, to build um, and strengthen the, the institutions um, that are going to be held accountable for the implementation um, of, of, of the changes that have been brought about. Thank you. I, mean, I can see a, a point building around the role of international norms and standards of processes that perhaps we'll hold a minute to return to. But if I could just first maybe bring in Linda here. Now, we're, we're talking a little bit about where um, there seem to be seem to be a favourable win, some degree of presidential imperative to support uh, reforms and the possibility to start that sort of progressive dynamic. Um, the bank is obviously heavily engaged also in countries which are more difficult, where that isn't the obvious um, context. And you mentioned also the way you're doing in terms of the strategy around them linked to sort of political economy analysis. Can you say a bit about where you think we stand on approaches in the more challenging environments? Sure. I mean, I think both these points made are extremely important. It really um, speaks to the, the critical need for leadership uh, in what are often very difficult and, and dangerous activities. And I think as development partners, we shouldn't uh, forget that and the very real challenges and risks that many of the people that we work with are facing. I think this also speaks a little bit to why I said I think as development partners, we need to think about having continuous engagements rather than episodic ones. At times, there are windows of opportunity to engage. And uh, it's important that in these very challenging areas that, that we establish relationships and, and are viewed as trusted brokers. And coming in at a last minute and thinking that you actually understand the political economy dynamic that's at hand isn't particularly effective. So this notion of sustained engagement, this notion of understanding the political economy reality and not bringing in some kind of technical solution that looks like it might be the, the, the functional or, or, or the best form to put in place isn't particularly helpful. And this more ongoing interactive dialogue with ranges of different constituencies is extremely important so that when there are windows of opportunity that there's actually opportunities then to, to engage and to take advantage of them. just um, bring you in on this question of, of institutions and, and those arrangements. I mean, it takes us quite nicely into the accountability domain, the role of supreme audit institutions. Um, 
Anyway, to challenge you a little bit on your comments, it suggested that there is um, some quite impressive progress around uh, Supreme Audit institutions, and we can see some ingredients about making them work. However, the links to the wider accountability domain are more challenging. Parliamentarians being seriously engaged and following up on audit findings, engagement with, with civil society, and, and somehow the dynamics that make the executive seriously interested and concerned about the findings of audit institutions. Um, don't always find um, sort of much, there isn't always evidence that we'd like to see in some countries. Perhaps you could say a little bit more about what you've spotted about ways forward and engaging with other stakeholders for a broader accountability domain. Uh, let, let me first say that uh, the United Nations last autumn uh, made a resolution built on uh, the need for independent uh, uh, Supreme Audit Institution. Uh, that resolution was anonymously uh, accepted by the United Nations, so you can say that all, you can believe that all uh, UN members understand that they need a, a Supreme Audit Institution which is uh, independent, but that's not the fully truth of it. But at least we have got an acceptance uh, from the United Nations. Secondly, a built a Supreme Audit Institution on its own is not enough without having the possibility to publish their report, without having a public accounts committee or similar in the parliament who can handle a report, without having a government who respects a report, uh, if there are a possibility that the politicians can hide the report and that's not shown uh, publicly, there is a lot of elements that you have to go into if you shall secure that the Supreme Audit Institution shall play an active role in, in promoting good governance, uh, securing transparency and accountability. For example, due to the question of connecting to the military uh, and to the police, there is always a challenging uh, issue for, uh, for the side to go into detail in these institutions because they hide under the um, uh, legislation connected to security and, and uh, you cannot go into these and these areas because they are, they are important for the national security and so on and so on. So if the, if the leadership of the, uh, of the country don't uh, play an active role securing the Supreme Audit Institution to handle these questions with the necessary secrecy that's necessary, uh, you will never go to the table a lot of the spending that uh, most of the institutions find natural for them to do. So to build also the possibility for the size to go into different area, difficulty areas is also important. Look seamless by switching mics. Um, I think what I'd like to do is sort of bring people in and some comments. I mean, we've started to draw out a few, um, a few strands here and looking at the possibilities of engaging politicians um, in this area that has perhaps suffered from a rather technocratic approach in the past, the role of the accountability domain. So what I'd like to do is, is collect a sort of a, a set of comments or if there are specific questions around the room and then we'll ask the panel to sort of come back on that. May I just ask people bef um, when they start just to, um, just to sort of let us know who they are and if they have an organisational affiliation then it helps the speakers um, contextualise that. Gentleman over there um, on the left, my left. Carlos Primo Braga, Director, World Bank Europe. I would like to pose my question to Mr. Abad, very interesting presentation. And I think it comes together with the issue that Linda pointed out about the importance of continuous engagement. Because when we talk about governance reform, there is a view of the world that I think it's totally discredited, but it's still out there, which is what I call the Niagara Falls view of the world is the view, you know, Niagara Falls, the water above and below are very calm, but the transition is a bitch. So <laughs> the Niagara Falls view of governance reform is that, yes, you have this equilibrium of high levels of corruption, you introduce a program of governance, transparency, and then you bring the country 
to an equilibrium that is with much lower levels of corruption. As Linda pointed out, in reality, this is a continuous struggle. And you have to engage throughout the process, and there is no silver bullet. So my question to you is based on your experience, because when I look at countries that have done strides in terms of governance progress, I always remember the experience of Indonesia, for instance, uh, Siri Mulyani Indrawat, uh, former minister, nowadays a managing director at the bank. She told us that, uh, well, we have to choose our fights because we cannot do everything in terms of tactics. Let's choose a few areas that have a very big demonstration effect. So she chose at that point in time customs administration in one of the main ports in Indonesia and really stayed with that reform at all costs to demonstrate results. My question to you, in the case of the Philippines, in terms of tactics, have you chosen a few priorities where you have focus and that you believe that have a major demonstration effect for the overall strategy? I might just take a couple more and then we'll, we'll come back in a batch to give some material for other speakers as well. That's right. Um, I think over there, the left, the lady with a hand up. Yeah. Sorry, we'll come to you in a sec. Thank you. I'm Franny Leotier from the African Capacity Building Foundation. I'm very happy to hear the uh, political economy dimension coming out from all the speakers. And I have two questions. One is that there are a lot of systems for data collection that help on the transparency side, like PFA, OBI, and so on. But they're done at different times, and they have major gaps in the years. Could this be an opportunity to get coherence on the data side, such that the transparency can actually improve and the accountability go along with that? My second question is on context dependency. Um, we're doing a, a survey with the um, African Development Bank, which uh, will come out in May, on the Africa governance outlook. And a lot of the early results indicate that when it comes to things like internal audit, control systems, uh, access to information, inclusion, they're highly context sensitive. So what advice do you have in terms of uh, lessons learning and sharing? Because the experiences that you shared are quite important. But if things are very context dependent, especially on the political economy side, what would be the general guidance that you would give on a pathway for reform? There was a, a couple of questions there. The gentleman with the microphone. Yeah, um, Tony Tuhan from Ibon in the Philippines, uh, we're an international organization, Better Aid, but we're based in the Philippines. Um, I would like to ask, uh, our minister has mentioned the role of CSOs and how that had supported the work of the budget, uh, the, the Department of Budget, and uh, in what ways uh, were civil society an important aspect in the, in the political economy and handling the military uh, in this case. And to, uh, to Kabri, um, before Ibon actually also not just undertook budget uh, advocacy, but also got expenditures advocacy. We had a good experience in the Philippines that our Department of Budget released actually expenditures for the whole year. And that allowed us to analyze expenditures, which is very different from budget and push reforms, especially towards the next budget processes. Uh, how possible is that, is that initiative for Africa, for example, in other countries? Um, another question to this round, and then we'll see if we have time to come back for some more. Um, thanks, and then I've clocked two gentlemen in the middle and to the right. Yeah. Nikos Karelambidis from uh, Greenpeace and Greece. Sounds like a little weapon, isn't it? Um, uh, I'm missing an answer to the, your first, the, the, the first question that the chair has put, and this is if developed countries are doing enough regarding uh, the public money spending, and the, the, the speaker that referred to that is Mr. Cole. I don't know if this is a coincidence or not. Let me be specific. Uh, an, an area that is combining development uh, um, uh, 
fight against um, unemployment, uh, covering basic needs, uh, environmental challenges, and, and then is related to energy production. Uh, I'm not going to speak about climate change, of course, but I, I'm going to focus on the area in the area. area. Two billion people uh, in the in, in our planet do not have access to modern uh, sources of energy. There was a report uh, published a few days ago by a European Environment Agency showing that uh, the use of coal in Europe is costing a few billions a year to the health system and several hundreds of deaths a year. And that's a cost. I'm not talking about the environmental aspect of it, I'm just talking about the cost. And this is highly subsidized with public money. So is this going to be a, a good example that we're going to export to developing countries? How do we deal with that? In nowadays, World Bank is funding around the globe a sequel of projects on producing energy with coal. That means that R&D money are not going to, to be spent in other sources, in energy efficiency, on renewables or whatever. So how do, we deal, how do we cope with that and how do we cope fast with that in order to export this bad or good lesson learned to a developing world that doesn't need to, repl to, to repeat our mistakes? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think part of that question may come up on the infrastructure session as well, as well tomorrow. Um, I've, got, I've got two people there, which I won't lose, but since there were more questions than comments, I'm going to take a, a quick round of responses to give some, um, so, so, the, so we don't lose the questions, and then I'll come up for a couple more questions. I've been told we have five minutes extra since we, we started late. Um, maybe I'll go from one end to the other. Um, and Mr. Abad, you were asked particularly about the, um, from the gentleman from the World Bank around picking fights, the tactics around reform strategy, and what chose you to pick those elements and, and what we could take from that? Well, that, that is exactly uh, right. Uh, corruption is a systemic problem. It, it, it pervades uh, not just the bureaucracy, but it's systemic in the sense that uh, the, the collaborators are not just in government, they're in the private sector. They're also in politics and therefore it's really important uh, to uh, to choose your battle. Uh, in in the area, for example, of uh, uh, the, the security agencies, we caught it at the right time when uh, you know, on the day that we actually met to discuss public financial management reforms uh, in the military, the headline of the biggest circulation newspaper was. Air Armed Forces of the Philippines is the most corrupt agency in the Philippines. You know, it's, uh, that was the headline. And uh, you know, the, the new leadership of the AFP were really placed under tremendous pressure uh, by the media, as well as by the Office of the President, to institute uh, uh, changes. You know? So, so it, it, was a, well, it was a particular window that we grabbed and uh, well, I cannot say that we have been fully successful, but this year, for example, uh, we, have, we are going to start using uh, debit cards for the uh, purchasing requirements of, uh, of uh, the military so that the liquidation process becomes instant because immediately you get them from, from uh, the bank, whereas before about 46% of their uh, cash activities were really cash advances, and you wouldn't know where they would come from and they, where would they go. So it, we caught them at that time. Uh, whereas, for example, uh, fighting the uh, pork barrel of politicians, uh, uh, it, certainly it's not a fight that I will fight today, but sometimes you just have to step backward a bit to be able to move forward, and in the instance, we had an initial very intense negotiation, which eventually we were able to succeed in uh, uh, limiting the use of pork barrel to a very uh, specified menu of projects that are related to the president's uh, priorities. And at the same time, we also got them to agree. At real time, we were going to publish releases made to those projects so that citizens can have access to the project listings of uh, the legislators, as well as uh, projects that are tendered 
who won the bids at what price uh, based on uh, you know the the tendered price so in a sense we we did not stop it but somehow we were able to move forward by limiting the scope of uh, the uh, discretion but at the same time uh, inducing transparency in the transactions using the pork barrel system so you're you're correct in in that there's just too many uh, areas to watch but you just have to pick uh, both the instances where the the political support is weak and therefore it's easy to come in and dismantle uh, the syndicate in that particular agency as well as you know the the timing that it opens up uh, to you thank you move along i think linda various points you might want to come in on um, regarding the the, the World Bank, the, the tactics um, around strategy and sequencing. I think it, it strikes me that one thing that people are always looking for is the answer to the question of what's the ideal sequence and do we know anything about that? Um, and that plays in nicely the context, question of context dependency, actually. And so there may be a few points you want to pick up. I think uh, you're right. We've churned long and hard about issues of sequencing and what's the ideal sequencing. And I think we could have that debate for the next decade and not have complete agreement around that. But I do think what it points to from country to context is really saying that we need to link reform programs to a good diagnostic about what is the problem that you're trying to solve. And that links also to the problem not only in an upstream system, but how that then has an impact and plays on the ability to deliver the services or reach the outcome that you're trying to achieve. In addition to the diagnostics about what the problem is, I think really understanding the political economy. What is, what, why is the current system currently in equilibrium the way it is? If it's not the uh, desirable outcome, what are the factors that are at play that are pushing the solution to that point? And finally, I think also in terms of thinking about the sequencing, we should be paying a lot of attention to this issue of capacity and capability. So when you think about capacity, which is oftentimes what we talk about, is there human resource capacity, is there the IT capacity, that in some sense is only part of the story and we need to probably be paying more attention also to what is the capability of turning that capacity into the outcome that we're actually trying to achieve. So I think in terms of trying to think through the issue of sequencing in particular country context, these are a few of the issues that I would um, suggest that one, one think about. I'd like to come back to just one other point on this question about whether or not one could link PIFA and OBI sequencing to uh, generate more information. I think uh, that uh, for a variety of reasons, they're quite different instruments and serve quite different purposes. I think it would be quite difficult to align the timing of these instruments. But what you raise is an important point. There's lots of initiatives that are out there that are looking at measuring aspects of budget institutions or transparency. And there's a sense that all of these initiatives don't add up to the sum of the parts that if in fact we found ways of actually coordinating those efforts better, there would be better, uh, more comprehensive, more regular information that would be available that could help in terms of pushing our understandings further in a better way than we do now. Free to pick up any points you want, but I, I think there were particular questions around linking with CSOs, civil society organisations. There's a question around um, transparency as well. But I wonder if also you may have some thoughts about the this issue. I think was referred to as sort of demonstration effect. Actually, that domain showing um, progress or, or exposing weaknesses and how that can lock into reform progress. It's obvious that, uh, as you said, if if you are going to to uh, put into projects, you have to have an evaluation and, and uh, have a concrete evaluation what's functioning, what's not functioning, what area should we put the investment in, where should we do our resources. Just go in, just to go in is, uh, as I see it, the, the wrong issue. You have to have a broad uh, evaluation and the donors has to do that together. Because what we see is the donors got in, gets in in different projects with different politi political uh, uh, 
commitments and, and uh, they have to be together and see the linkage of what they are doing connected to the results. And secondly, there was an interesting question connected to environmental uh, issues and good governance. Why invest in, uh, in, uh, in, in projects that uh, done to destroy our climate or some, uh, some other areas? Of course, that is a very interesting question. In, in the InterSci, we are developing working groups in every InterSci regions to look into questions about environmental auditing. Uh, I think this is an issue this, which Supreme Audit Institution has to go into, and it's a question about good governance, but it's also a question about what is uh, the right policy for the, for the future. I can mention a lot of uh, different audits that we are doing, both national or joint audits, uh, perhaps the biggest audits we are now doing together in, in, in a world perspective is how the different countries follow up the Kyoto uh, Protocol. So this is questions which is on the agenda. So I'll, I'll pass it. Thanks very much. Um, Neil, I, I just wanted, in addition to the questions you've, you've sort of covered, whether you could start giving some thoughts as well on these questions from Cadbury members on the sort of the sequencing of reform and your views on that. And equally this point that Linda was drawing, distinguishing capacity and capability, and whether there's something else in the nature rather than just the technical skills, but the capability around reform and what, what we're learning from countries would be really interesting. Thanks, Ed. I, I sometimes wonder whether we should change this word sequencing to the synchronising um, because it almost seems to imply that there needs to be several things that are happening at the same time and they're all kind of working together like an orchestra because um, sequencing um, implies that something needs to be done before the next thing can happen. And, um, and, and one of the things that we have learnt is that reforms do not always follow a linear pattern. Um, but sequencing is, is, is one of those complex things about, about reform. It, it, it's about, um, yes, understanding the context. It, it's about understanding at what point can you now make progress um, on a particular reform. Um, I mean, there's, there's a very wise um, professor that's, that's at Maryland University called Alan Schick. Um, that, that always emphasized um, the importance of getting the basics right. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, certainly, I've found that, um, that many countries make mistakes when they move towards program budgeting without really having a proper line item budget. Um, and and I, I sometimes wonder how you're going to lump things together into a program if you do not understand what you're spending on personnel or what you're spending on your administration. Um, so it, the basics, it's, it, it's one of those things that, that I think was also mentioned earlier um, by, by Ian, um, that maybe it's the right advice, but we just haven't bothered to implement. Um, and I think there's a, lot of, there's, a lot of what, there's a lot of things right in what has been identified as the basics within, within public financial management that we may want to, that we may, may want to revisit before we, before we move too fast into some of the more ambitious and, and I suppose, sexy reforms um, um, that, we have been, that we have been talking about. Um, let me, let, let, let me um, um, turn to, to the question that was asked um, by, by the representative from, from, from Better Aid, um, Tony. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's important. Um, I mean, there, there has to be advocacy um, and better information on expenditure. Um, Cabri will be collaborating with um, the OECD on an expenditure review um, as we consider this to be important information um, or important because it will, it will in, in Cabri's relationship with finance ministries, it will get finance ministries to also move towards improving the information not only on the budget, but also information on how money that has been allocated um, is, being, is being spent and whether it is being spent on that which it has been allocated to. Um, so we, 
we, we, we will be focusing on that in, in the period going forward, and, and hopefully that will also um, be an important tomb of information in our, in our budget resource center that we, that we plan to establish as, as CABRI. Um, the, the question from the gentleman that has just left the room, um, and I'm not too sure whether he said he's from Greenpeace or Greece Peace um, about, about energy. Um, I mean, uh, clearly we're not going to end up convincing each other on um, um, you know, the pros and cons of, 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 of using coal for energy. Um, but there's one word that, that, that seems to be used by, um, by, by, I suppose one can call it the greenies, the liberals, the conservatives, is the word sustainability. Um, because on the one hand, I mean, there's a, there's a sustainability in terms of addressing energy needs. Um, and, and, and lots of the consideration there are socio-economic, socio-political con considerations. Um, so South Africa has, has coal, um, and it's a te technology we understand, and we have huge, we have huge energy needs. So we are, we are using um, the coal that we have um, for our energy needs, and, and, and two big um, coal-fired power stations are being built, and um, we're grateful for, for the loans from from, from the World Bank and the African Development Bank for that. But at the same time, we know that we cannot go on um, burning coal and we'll, we'll have to stop burning coal long before all the coal is used up. Um, so many of those, many of those agreements have, have clean energy um, components built into them um, and also um, um, an awareness that, that new technology has to, has to come on stream. Um, I mean, the alternative to coal may also not please um, too many people, um, because at the moment the alternative to coal um, looks as if it's going to be nuclear. Um, um, so, so, so instead of dealing with our health issues in the next 50 years, let's deal with it in the next 5,000 years, right? Um, thank you. <laughs> you may have sparked some more comments from the panel before I give them all an opportunity to comment. I, let, let's try and take another round because I'm, I'm conscious and there, there's a gentleman there who has his hand up and another gentleman um, who also wants to speak before. In addition to any, any comments raised, we're, we're moving towards that part of the session where we're also interested to know what the scope and the remit and anyway, and the mandate for international action and the role of international processes be those sort of norms and standards or organisations. So any comments on that, welcome as well as um, on points addressed so far. Anyway, sorry, please. The political economy, uh, but this morning uh, I think there is something missing uh, because this morning when we were discussing uh, the relation between the taxation and the expenditure, I think it is very important, uh, there is no doubt, uh, but uh, in any case governments, uh, they run deficits and they accumulate a huge amount of debts. It means that there are some drivers on the expenditure side that are not completely much on the taxation at least in short term, because in long term, someone has to pay. So it means that, uh, uh, and I think it was nailed from Cabri, we have to pay much more attention on the allocation. And the allocation, I have the impression that when you speak about effectiveness or expenditure, you are speaking more on the efficiency and not on the priorities that we have to, to finance. And this uh, as, is an important part that, unfortunately, it happens in period of crisis. When the government have to reduce their spending, then there is a debate what we have to reduce. We have to reduce the pension age, we have to reduce this and that, but not on the medium term base. And uh, even when Nail touched on the location, but very briefly, you touch on the struggle between uh, the different ministries, which is an important component. I think it was even Alan Sheik who said, whatever the budget classification that you use, you end up always on the institutional allocation of the budget according to the power of the different ministries. But there is the question also on priorities, and I think it's important to have a public debate, and this is part of accountability, what kind of policies we can afford. And this morning we spoke about someone said that the OECD has to use uh, his role not to have uh, to be a f uh, fight uh, fire, 
to reflect more. And I think you should reflect more, particularly on the emerging developing countries where you have a different structure of the population, different needs are arising. So how we can better define those priorities and those policies? Thanks. Challenging question. I'll give the panel pause for thought while we see. Are there any other comments? I can see someone just just there in the middle. Can we get a microphone <coughs> to you? I think we. Sorry, please bear with us. Sorry, I was so far away. Stefan Klingebier, German Development Institute, DIE. Uh, I think uh, Aitken has really this kind of positive role when it comes to public financial management systems because aid can provide support and so on. But on the other hand, um, aid might have also a quite problematic role, at least in those countries with a high level of aid dependencies. And um, I know about these activities around aid on budget and, and other activities to, to make sure that um, aid is not bypassing national systems and by bypassing, weakening also national systems, including the role of the parliament, including the role of the auditor general and so on. So this kind of knowledge is present. And my question to the panel is, uh, what can we do in order to make further progress so that aid has really this kind of positive and constructive role? Thank you. Another question, if anyone has anything else Bernie, yes, please. Yeah, I thought it was easier because we sit next to each other. Uh, Stefan Leiderer, also from German Development Institute. I would just have a question regarding transparency and accountability and the role of supreme audit institutions, etc. Because I think we all agree, of course, that for the effectiveness of public expenditure, it's very important to have more accountability, more transparency. And I think experience or evidence tells us that we are fairly good in supporting what you would call the supply side of this accountability. So we are improving the effectiveness of SIEs. Uh, we are improving also maybe, well, transparency, uh, aid on budget, etc. But um, maybe you can say a little bit more what, how we can tackle the political economy on the demand side for accountability. So when it comes to the demand for transparency and accountability in parliaments, in civil society, in media, etc. Because this is more not only about budget literacy and uh, technical capacity, it has a lot to do with the, the political power structures, etc. So maybe you have some, some comments on what we can do on these issues and especially what role external actors, when we are talking about aid and international networks, etc., can play in this. Thing. Thank you very much. I, I've got three very meaty questions there, and I think I'll ask the, the panelists to sort of try and make a reflection on, on each of them. I'll maybe start in reverse order. I know certainly the first question was around, we, we talked a lot about the PFM system somehow, but this question of the composition of allocational issues at expenditure and um, budgets that are better aligned to policy priorities and deliver on them. Um, secondly, the, the big question on aid on budgets, and I know there are clearly studies, um, um, a lot of Cadbury's done a lot of work, but equally across the panel there, there is a certain experience on that. And thirdly, on this, this issue that just, just raised on um, demand side accountability. Um, this, this, as these are sort of closing comments as well, I would just ask um, the speakers to reflect on, given the backdrop what the, and the context of the OECD strategy on development, what role or scope there is to bring in um, the contribution that the OECD might play in this mix as well. If there are any reflections of that, I'd be interested to, to hear. But uh, maybe I'll start from this side this time and work that way, um, please. Uh, thanks, Ed. Um, I, I thought that I did mention um, in, in my presentation that, that I believed that policy informs budget allocations um, um, and, and, and really the, the start to the discussion that takes place with, within the budget process. But also a very important role um, and, and the reason why we, we, we need to um, or why politicians have to be part of the process is because they are the ones that have to make the important and agree on the important trade-offs that need to be made. Need, need to be made. Um, I mean, uh, uh, technicians can, can provide um, certain inputs around um, whether plans are credible, um, whether certain um, spending programs are aligned to, to, to policy priorities. Um, 
but it is, it, 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 it is the cabinet and the cabinet members that are going to have to take the decisions with regard to um, the trade-off between equally important um, um, policy priorities of a, of, of a government. And, and I think that is, that is um, um, an, 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 important, um, an important point to, to, to be made. Um, the, the question on, on, on aid, um, is, is a is a critical one and um, and and an and an interesting discussion that 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 was started in the lead up to Busan, um, especially the discussions that were coming out of the AUC and also um, in in the Tunis cons consensus um, just, just prior to to the Busan outcome document was that aid aid should work itself out of a job, um, and, and and what was quite interesting was that. Um, there was an examination of um, how does, I mean, the kind of modalities that we put in place, the kind of things that aid supports that is going to contribute towards it working itself out of a job. Um, should aid be moving towards um, supporting the productive sectors in, in, in um, heavily dependent, aid dependent countries? Um, so that you can improve domestic resource mobilization within those countries so that over time they become less less dependent on aid. Um, some difficult questions that, that, that have been raised in, in that regard. Um, but it also points to um, some of the unanswered questions within the Busan outcome document. Um, I mean, take earmarked, earmarked funding, take use of country systems, and, and, and start asking um, how does this, in fact, contribute towards not achieving that objective of aid working itself out of a job? Um, um, how does ignoring the use of country systems um, lessen the possibilities of the, the, the productive sectors within aid-dependent countries um, being grown um, um, through, 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 through aid making use of, of, of the systems that exist or the industries that exist within a dependent countries um, so, that you, so that you start developing that country's ability to, to, um, to raise more domestic revenue. Um, and the only way that countries are going to be in a position um, to become less dependent on aid is if they are in a position over time to start raising their own their own domestic resources. I, I think it's an it, it it's an obvious point. Um, it's how we get there that is going to pose some very difficult some very difficult challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no question. I, I, I'm a strong believer in building political and administrative infrastructure in governments, in parliaments, in the society as I know, on the national and regional and local level. Without that, uh, you, it's very difficult to, to, uh, to get all support to be sustainable. And it has to be in our view when we go into the different projects that this has to be sustainable. This shall not benefit people only while the support is giving. It shall be a part of building an infrastructure that can provide for support to people in the future. That's why I'm so occupied of building institutions. Secondly, corruption is perhaps one of the most important issues that we have to fight. Uh, without fighting corruption, we will have no possibility to reach the Millennium Goals of the United Nations. And to fight corruption, you, you have to develop uh, uh, good political and administrative infrastructure. You have to develop supreme audit institution. You have to develop the, the, the judicial side. You have to have a court system which is independent and secure to be intended. A lot of issues which you have to concentrate on. Therefore, I, I'm so occupied that uh, what's happening in Busan was that at least you can see there is a strategy where donors can uh, come together and, and, and form a common platform 
not using their resources to implement different initiatives who is not suited to one and this other. So, so if you don't do that, uh, we can un end up in that national priorities in Norway, Denmark, Germany, other countries are in head of the priorities, what's needed in the countries that we want to support. That will be, in my point of view, a catastrophe because that will not be sustainable uh, 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 support. I, I don't want to call, call it aid. Uh, it's more or less uh, support. Um, and and uh, you can do whatever you, you want to do, but if that's not sustainable, it's a waste of money. And, and uh, it's not good governance, neither in the country that you invest in, nor in the country who, take, who pays the money. So, of course, the Norwegian or the German Auditor General's uh, Office will react, react if you see that is, uh, behind the structure of your investments is not a, a question about uh, a sustainable uh, uh, development. Uh, so, uh, hopefully, what's happened in Busan, uh, on top of what's happened in Paris, could, could bring us into better future, better cooperation, better investments, uh, sustainable investments. And, uh, and, and, and finally, uh, I, I really hope that uh, we can be able to work together in the future bec because we see in countries where we go in taking a fuller responsibility for the whole, whole chain, uh, we succeed. But in, in the countries that we are not investing in the chain, but only in parts of this, uh, we don't succeed. Uh, and there is a question, uh, but the donors has a, a tendency to be very glad in investing in countries where everything is in good process. They should also be interested in discussing to invest in, in countries where the process is not so very good. Uh, Djibouti, uh, the Auditor General's office burnt down. Uh, no donors has been interested in helping them to build new premises. It's just an example of how soon you can be forgotten in the international society. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Thanks. The observation that this session discussed largely issues of public expenditure management, I think, was correct. But the issue of public expenditure allocation is also clearly an important one. This morning, Nora was talking a bit about incidents of public expenditures. In, in the World Bank, we've developed a human opportunity index that allows you to look at whether personal circumstances, such as gender or ethnicity or location of residence, actually has an influence on the opportunity to access service. And I think these types of analytics, this type of diagnostic, can usefully feed into the discussion around public expenditure allocations. Let me just make one observation on the question of use of country systems. And there I think the real challenge is for us not to think about this as a binary choice. Use country systems or don't use country systems. And I think unfortunately that is at times the direction that we had where a number of development partners may choose not to use a country system because they are concerned about weaknesses and fiduciary risks that that may entail. I believe that there are intermediate ways, even if there are weaknesses in country institutions and country systems, for development partners to find ways to use them so that they're actually strengthened, rather than, as you say, actually undermine uh, the, the development and strengthening of those systems. I just want to go back to the earlier observation about the usefulness of uh, crisis periods in making uh, or in pushing difficult uh, changes as, uh, as against uh, business as usual environments where you really end up making incremental uh, changes. And that's why many of the countries who are going through a period of uh, transition, either from a corrupt regime or from a dictatorship, they also present a lot of opportunities for making these difficult uh, changes, but it does require for the reformers to be able to comprehend 
what the nature of the crisis is and where, where are the points where you can in fact influence the direction of the crisis so that you can convince people to adopt uh, those difficult uh, decisions. We, in the Philippines just this past year, we've had uh, uh, serious uh, uh, casualties uh, due to uh, typhoons and, 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 and floodings and uh, uh, it, it was an opportunity for us to shift uh, uh, government uh, priorities to really put uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation programs high up in the government's priorities. In fact, uh, what has been uh, 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 delayed for so many years uh, by way of a country action plan finally took uh, center stage and it wasn't difficult for uh, the president, for example, to convince Congress that uh, we do need uh, uh, to provide substantial, as in substantial investments in, in that area. The other point I, I wish to make has to do with the, uh, uh, you know, the problems that uh, can arise when we treat politics as an externality. You know, something that you, you, you should try to avoid to the extent that you can because I think it's a falsehood. It's, you cannot avoid it. It's at the heart of uh, uh, budget or resource uh, allocation. Last week, uh, some of us who've had experience in politics and in the social movements uh, sat down with some of the cabinet secretaries who were doctors or from the private sector who never had to deal with, uh, with politics. And, and we grappled with this uh, situation because uh, we, we observed that uh, uh, you know, these departments, Department of Health, Department of Finance, or those departments that have had, that were having problems with their own bureaucracies, as well as with their own uh, constituencies. And one of the things we discovered was uh, uh, the uh, department heads uh, were trying to avoid having to deal with uh, politics. And their first uh, confession was, well, we don't know how to. We never had to deal with this thing in the private sector. And I, I think it's, it's very critical uh, to have those uh, conversation even within uh, the cabinet. Uh, wh one big uh, program where we shifted a uh, huge uh, uh, budget was the uh, program on social protection, which is at the heart, the uh, conditional cash transfer program. We moved something like uh, 29 billion pesos uh, from a small investment the president putting it right at the front and center of his uh, poverty reduction program. And immediately there was a reaction from Congress because here is a program that does not go through the traditional uh, channels of uh, you know, people receiving money, not through, the, not through them, whether the legislators or the local politicians. And it, and, 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 and this program, which, by the way, benefited from our people uh, being exposed to Bolsa Familia in Brazil and the opportunities in Mexico, but understanding the politics of, uh, of those programs, the, uh, the, the head of uh, the, head, the, the department head who was managing it, the Secretary of Social Welfare and Development, was a community organizer. And one way by which he addressed the uh, opposition from the politician was by organizing family councils every month, you know, where they invited politicians to come and to listen to uh, the mothers, uh, explaining why this program is important to them and what they, why, what, why they should not be afraid of the program. But this is something that is not for them or for the government, but for the children, because it's meant to bring them back to school and get them immunized. And so it's, it's, really, it's really important uh, for, for, for for major shifts in expenditures, for, for us to develop some analytical framework of understanding how, how politics plays a role in uh, facilitating it. Very much, as I, I think the, the concluding comments have shown, an extremely rich discussion, and in some ways we're just getting into the meat of that. And that's possibly right, because now that can be, can be taken forward. Um, I won't attempt to sort of sum up the summing up, but rather ask you to join me in thanking an excellent panel who've offered for really, really um, sort of different, distinctive, but very important perspectives. And also to thank Sara from the OECD, who's convened this, this panel today, which has really addressed the topic. So please join me in saying thank you very much.